This video is brought to you in collaboration with wowhead.com. Hello everyone! With Battle for Azeroth, Zandalari trolls are gonna become a playable race for the hordes, but what exactly do we know about them? Where did they come from? How do they live? How do they view the world? And what have they done in the story of Warcraft? That is what we're gonna be talking about today. I do want to give a heads up, I'll be using footage from the alpha to accompany the story. Now I won't be going into any major details, but say that you want to be completely surprised with everything that's coming in the next expansion, then do be warned, spoilers ahead. Let's begin, shall we? In the beginning, when the Titans had imprisoned the old gods and brought order to the planet of Azeroth, life was blooming. Nowhere was this more evident than in the dense woodlands around the Well of Eternity. This fount of Azeroth's arcane lifeblood, it accelerated the cycles of growth and rebirth. Before long, sentient beings evolved from the land's primitive life forms, amongst the first and most prolific that would be the trolls. The early trolls developed a wide array of superstitious customs. Some practiced cannibalism and devoted themselves to warfare. A rare few sought knowledge through mystic practices and meditation. Still others honed their ties to a dark and powerful form of magic known as voodoo. Yet no matter their individual customs, what all trolls shared was a common religion that revolved around Kalimdor's elusive wild gods. The trolls called these powerful beings Loa and they worshipped them as deities. Countless Loa exist. Most are weak, but some are very powerful. Most are shapeless, whereas others have animal or creature forms. So the term Loa, they could be used for someone like Cenarius or Goldrin, creatures known as wild gods. But the term also applies to a being like Bonsamdi, the Loa of death, or Hakar, the soul flayer, which is the Loa of blood. Powerful, enlightened Zandalari can become Loas upon their death, or at least so is believed, and I actually wonder if it's just for the Zandalari, since Vol'jin, he has had several visions where his father popped up, hinting at Senjin of the Dark Spear tribe also being a Loa. There could also be just the spirits. Either way, Zandalari families, they often worship their own family Loas. Cities usually have their own civic deities, and the greatest Loa are worshipped by the nation as a whole. To the reverence for the wild gods, the trolls gathered near a series of peaks and plateaus in southern Kalimdor. This was home to many of their honored Loa. The trolls gave the holy mountain range the name Zandalar, and soon enough they were building small encampments upon its slopes. The most powerful group of trolls, that was called the Zandalari tribe, its members claimed nearly all of Zandalar's tallest plateaus, believing them to be sacred grounds. Atop the highest peak, they constructed a small cluster of crude shrines. In time, these grew into a bustling temple city, which now is known as Zulazar. This Zandalari society, it has remained an unchanging hierarchy for thousands of years. Hardworking farmers, fishers and craftsmen, they are the peasants, they form the foundation of the empire. The Zandalari elders, they tell them what to harvest, when to plant and how to behave. To disobey the elders is to disobey the god, an offense punishable by exile or death. The Zandalari warrior caste, they sit above the peasantry, acting as the arms of the king and the might of the council. Dexterity is not prized among Zandalari warriors, rather they go for brute force backed by ancient magics, that is the preferred combat style. Above that are the scholars and the priesthoods, those that dictate every aspect of the Zandalari society down to the very last detail. They are the masters of magic and communing with the spirits, while the highest of these, they have a seat on the Zanchuli council, which both advise the king and ensure his every command is executed. The council is consulted before every battle or major decision, but above all of them from a golden throne, their lords the king of the Zandalari. It was the Tsar who was the first, but in the current day and age it's the great king Rastakhan. Empowered by the Zandalari gods themselves to act as their voice, he is ruled for over 200 years. Trolls are long-lived, but that seems to be exceptionally long. This has to do with Razan, the Loa of Kings, which stands at Rastakhan's side and he is the one empowering him. To figure out where exactly their people belong, the Zandalari, they start testing their children at a very early age. Those that are blessed and showing signs of connection with the Loa, they receive full priest training and all of the honor and privilege that accompanies it. Those that are not blessed, they will be given the opportunity to prove that they're going to grow into strong warriors someday. But those that fail both tests, well, they end up at the bottom. That is the Zandalari society in a nutshell. And at the beginning, Life was very good. Azeroth was pretty much the playground to learn, to worship and to grow. Of course, over the next several centuries, other tribes arose to challenge the Zandalari for territory and power. The most notable of these were the fearsome Gurubashi, the Amani and the Drakari. They laid claim to enormous swaths of lands in Kalimdor's lush jungles and woods. 
On occasion, tribes would clash with each other, but trolls, they were such skilled and fierce fighters that any real conflict, they would cost both sides dearly. There was so much land to go around that it was often wiser to just resettle than actually risk war. There was only one spot that was forbidden by the tribes, witch doctors and priests, a small mount of blackened stone at the base of the Zandalar mountains. Over the years though, curiosity actually won out, and a group of rebellious trolls, believing that they had found an undiscovered loa, they started to perform vile rituals and living sacrifices to awaken this slumbering monstrosity. Unknown to the trolls was that this being was actually Kifix, a Kefraxi general, and with their actions they kicked off the Akir and Troll War. Kifix was a monster from the days of the Black Empire, and he figured that it would delight the old gods to see this puny troll civilization rent to ashes. He rallied the Akir swarms, another remnant of the days that the old gods ruled the world, and they started to swarm the land. As the Akir encroached perilously close to the Zandalar mountains, the Zandalari moved to act. They united the troll tribes into a single mighty force, which they called the Empire of Sul. Under the Zandalari guidance, differences would be put to the side, Loa and warriors alike, they went to battle, and not only did they push Kifix force away from their sacred mountains, they made sure to nip this threat in the butt. At the Zandalari's behest, the other tribes moved out to permanently end the threat. To do so, they could leave no corner of the continent unguarded. So it was that the Zandalari convinced the most power-hungry troll factions to hunt down the Akir, and then establish new strongholds across Azeroth, and claim these fertile new lands for themselves without any competition. The Amani, they went off the Kafix to the northeast, where they actually killed it. The Rakari, they pushed to the cold north, while the Gurubashi, they went southwest. All victories were hard earned, but after years of war, the trolls, although unable to completely wipe out the Akir, they were victorious and reclaimed their dominance over the lands. Now without war to actually bind them together, the troll factions grew ever more distant and insular. The far-flung strongholds of the different tribes, they started to blossom into vibrant home, temple cities, and eventually empires in their own right. The Zandalari withdrew to the mountain plateaus to pursue spiritual knowledge, but it would always maintain an immense influence over the separate troll societies. Yet another society, it started to draw the interest of the Zandalari. This was the Mogul Empire led by Leishan the Thunder King, who had taken the powers from Keeper Ra. With those powers, they'd enslave the land and build wonders. The Zandalari in particular were amazed at the otherworldly powers that was wielded by the Thunder King. One of the leaders, a revered high priest named Zulafra, saw in the Mogu a golden opportunity. They might hold the power of this world, but it was the trolls that held the knowledge of the land. Their empires would make each other great and teach each other their secrets. Once they were allies, nothing on Azeroth would dare to oppose them. Lei Shen was actually interested in the idea. With the trolls' aid, they would learn the mysteries of the land a lot faster. But in truth, both leaders actually plotted betrayal. Zulafra believed the Zandalari could steal Lei Shen's godlike powers once they learned the Mogu's secrets, and the Thunder King. He planned to enslave the Zandalari the moment that they ceased being useful. For now though, even to the public, they kept the true plans concealed and they made their allegiance. In exchange for the Zandalari's knowledge, the Mogul would train them in the ways of arcane magic. They also promised the trolls a swath of fertile land near the Vale, and to ensure that his reign would never end, Lei Shen fought to Lafra the secrets of resurrecting him. He didn't exactly trust his own people with that knowledge, knowing that the Mogu, they were all about power, and would most likely try to claim the empire for themselves. Only the Zandalari would hold the key to resurrecting Lei Shen. Without him, the trolls knew that they would never fully learn the secrets of the arcane, nor would they be able to claim his awesome power. Though both leaders continued scheming, the betrayals would never come to fruition, and they actually became invaluable allies. Yet Lei Shen's arrogance, that would also be his downfall. He set his eyes on claiming the Forge of Origination, which was located in the land of Uldum, and he was ready to add it to his empire. The Tolvir, left behind by Keeper Ra to keep an eye on the place, they were actually outraged when they heard what Lei Shen had done to their Keeper. They would never join his side, so the Thunder King, he made ready to take it by force, and he was so confident in his victory that he invited Zulafra to witness what he claimed would be the Mogul Empire's greatest victory yet. The elderly Zandalari leader agreed. Lei Shen had artificially extended the troll's life, but once all of the Keeper's work were under Mogul control, they would unlock the secrets of immortality. Almost all of the highest ranking Zandalari leaders, they accompanied Zulafra as an honor guard, expecting to return to the capital with the gift of eternal life. This 
didn't go exactly as planned though. Although the Tolf here did not have the numbers to even remotely stand a chance, they did have the forge. You may remember this as being part of the Uldum questing, a weapon designed to purge the world if it became too corrupted, something that would have been activated if we didn't kick some sense into Elgalon. The Tolf here had configured it to scour only the nearby land and everything within it. Leishen, the Zandalari, the Tolf here waiting outside and the land of Uldum, all of it felt the might of the energies of unmaking. What once was a lush jungle, a paradise as they described it, it had now turned into the desert as we know it today. Creatures all across Kalimdor witnessed the flash on the southern horizon, and this is the reason why the Tolvir hit the land of Uldum with magic, and why we only saw it after the Cataclysm. Now the death of Leishen, and the upper caste of the Zandalari, that of course left the massive power vacuums in both of their empires. Before the Tolvir shrouded Uldum in their grand illusion, a handful of Thunder King loyalists, they recovered Leishen's corp from the the region. They brought it back to the Empire and enshrined it within the Tomb of Conquerors, yet with most of the Zandalari leadership dead, there was no one to actually revive the Thunder King. A succession of Emperors followed Leishen, but none would ever wield as much power as he had. The Zandalari too spent generations attempting to recover from the loss of Uldum. The catastrophic event had struck a mortal blow to both of the empires, and neither would ever regain its former glory. But of course, that didn't stop the trolls from trying over and over again. At this point in time, we've pretty much reached the height of Troll and Zandalari dominance of the world. Azeroth had been their playground, but their defeat in Uldum, it marked a turning point, and it wouldn't exactly get much better after this. They eventually tried to collect what was promised, a large plot of land near the Vale of Eternal Blossoms, but that agreement was made with Le Shen the Thunder King, and not the Pandaren that had been able to overthrow the Mogul Masters. Mengazi, a descendant of Zulafra, decided that it would be a good idea to strike without warning, and with enough force to shattered the Pandaren's will. It had been a few decades since the slave revolution, and most of the Pandaren, they'd not exactly kept up with their kung fu. Hopefully outnumbered and outmaneuvered, they were losing hearts. But one Pandaren, called Jiang, brought their salvation. When she was a child, she had found a cloud serpent hatchling, alone and barely injured after a terrible storm destroyed its nests. At the time, the Pandaren regarded the flying cloud serpents as untamable and violent beasts, but Zheng nursed him back to health and befriended him. As the monks fought a losing battle atop the cliffs of the Jade Forest, Zheng and her serpentine companion Lo, they swooped down from the clouds. Lo's fury and fire, it broke the Zandalari ranks, forcing them to retreat. News of the victory, it spread throughout the empire, and others followed in Jiang's footsteps. They too tamed the powerful cloud serpents, and soon enough, a small army arose to fly into battle at Jiang's side. These brave Pandaren, they became known as the Order of the Cloud Serpents. The tide of war had turned, the trolls knew that there was little that they could do to win by conventional means, so Mengazi turned to a final tactic, resurrecting the Thunder King. A pitched battle erupted near the Tomb of Conquerors, where Lei Shen's corpse was enshrined. Zhang sacrificed herself in a final, desperate attack, killing Mengazi, which in turn caused the others on the Lari to soon break ranks and run back to their homeland in shame. Meanwhile, Dark Trolls found a way to the Well of Eternity, a fount of arcane power that slowly but surely evolved them into the Night Elves. With the Well, they had a mighty supply of arcane magical might, and not since the Black Empire in ages past had a territory grown so vast in size and scope. The immense influence that Queen Azara held over the world and its denizens, it eclipsed even Lei Shen's wildest dreams of power. From time to time, knighters and trolls, they would clash with each other, the trolls always buckling before the devastating magics wielded by the elves. In the queen's eyes, the trolls were just a minor nuisance, their battle lust a symptom of primitive and unenlightened minds. Ultimately, they struck an accord with the Zandalari tribe. In exchange for ending these troll incursions into night elf territory, the Zandalari would be allowed, by Azara's grace of course, to keep the sacred Zandalari mountains south of the well. The trolls begrudgingly agreed, fully aware that there stood no chance against their enemy's arcane powers. The Zandalari, they kept the tribes under control, but this shameful moment, it fostered the troll's deep resentment towards the Night Elves, a bitter hatred that would carry on for generations to come. Azara, 
she didn't care. She had her eyes and her mind on the well of eternity and the secrets held within. It wouldn't be long until they made contact with Sargeras. They tried to summon a burning legion into the world and the war of the ancients played out. At the end, it was the resistance that won victory over the queen. The well imploded, sundering the land of Kalimdor and turning it into what we know it as today with the Maelstrom as an eternal reminder of those events. Of course, splitting the land like that, it had quite an impact on the world. The emperor of the land known as Pandaria, he was able to hide it behind the mist and keep its people safe. While the Zandalari, they caused strong protective spells to protect their home from destruction. Even so, they could not shield the rest of the continent. The ground beyond their shield was drawn underwater. When at last the Sundering was over, the Zandalari saw that their home had become an island. Not all of the Night Elves had been wiped out either. Those that resisted the Queen, they had survived, and Illidan Stormrage, he even made a brand new well with waters taken from the original one, something that the others of his kind, they couldn't exactly appreciate. He was imprisoned, they grew a happy little tree over this new well to contain its power and the use of arcane magic that became punishable by death. Some amongst them though, they could not and would not give up their ancient birthrights. They had no plans of stopping with the arcane, but since there were so many of them, instead of execution, they were actually exiled. Led by Duffermar Sunstrider, they set sail, eventually ending up in the Amani territory, where they created their city of Quelphalus. They built the Sunwell with another vial of water from the original well, and of course, the Amani trolls, they were not exactly happy with the new neighbors. They didn't stand much of a chance against their arcane magical might though, but in the Amani, the Zandalari saw an opportunity to revitalize one of the race's most powerful tribes and reassert troll dominance within the Eastern Kingdoms. Quelphalus was not as powerful as the ancient Night of Empire that had decimated the trolls so long ago. In addition, the Zandalari had honed and perfected their own voodoo arts, so a handful of wise Zandalari emissaries, they made the journey from their island home to Zulaman. They appointed Jinta to be the ruler of the Amani, and with the aid of the mighty Loa demigods, they were able to cause some massive damage to the elves. Unfortunately for them, the now high elves, they made an allegiance with the early humans in the area, and their combined force, they were able to not only engulf their leader Jinta in flames, without their leader, the surviving trolls broke broke ranks and retreated. The elves and humans hunted them down like game, slaughtering every Amani combatant that they could find. The disastrous battle, it floored the Zandalari emissaries. Once so confident of victory, they skulked back to their island home in disbelief and shame yet again. Now helping out the other troll tribes, that was not the only thing that the Zandalari were doing. They also explored the numerous islands that dotted the newly formed sea between Kalimdor and the Eastern Kingdoms. It was during these voyages that the trolls discovered Kazan, an isle inhabited by goblins. Now the Zandalari, they had come to Kazan in search of strange mineral called Kashemite. The consumption of vaporized Kashemite, it caused a whole range of effects such as heightened senses, hallucinations and increased intelligence. The trolls greatly valued the mineral and saw it as a sacred component for their rituals and ceremonies. For centuries, they mined from the numerous Kajamite veins running close to the surface of the islands. Occasionally, they employed goblins to work for them, paying them with shiny but cheap trinkets that the small creatures prized. The arrangement changed once the trolls discovered an unimaginable deposit of Kajamite buried deep underground, more than the Zandalari would ever need. Rather than dig for it themselves, they enslaved the goblins and forced them to mine under abysmal conditions. For thousands of years, the goblins suffered, too weak to resist. But in the end, it was the Kashemite itself that led to the goblins' salvation. Within the mines, a cloud of Kashemite dust, it always blanketed it. Over time, breathing it in, it awakened the goblins' intelligence and their craftiness. Secretly, they plotted to overthrow their slave masters, using whatever materials they could find to fashion traps, explosives, and other ingenious weaponry. The troll overseers were caught off guard when the goblin masses stormed from the mine, armed with technology beyond even what the Zandalari possessed. The revolution, it shattered the trolls hold over Kazan, laying waste to the mining operation and leaving behind untold destruction. The survivors on the Ladi, they fled and the goblins celebrated the new liberation by turning on each other in a mad scramble to fill the void of power and in time it would be them enslaving the trolls for themselves. Meanwhile, over at the Gurubashi tribe, they weren't really doing great after Sundering. Poverty and hardship, it was a day-to-day -day thing, and many of the hunting and farming grounds were forever lost. Desperate to reclaim their former glory, they turned to the powerful Loa spirits, and the creature that answered their call, that was Hakar the Soul Flayer, the Loa of Blood. 
the malevolent spirits. It promised to help the Kurubashi extend their empire across the lower half of the eastern kingdoms. In return, he demanded large numbers of living sacrifices. His followers became known as the Hakari, and for years they fed the Dark Loa, which in turn increased his power. Under his control, the Gurubashi had achieved all that they had hoped for, conquering massive amounts of land and even many of the islands that dotted the coast of the South Seas. The Zandalari, observing the events from afar, they were pleased at first. Like proud parents, they saw their children return to conquest and the traditional worship. Yet, when it became clear that Hakkar's bloodlust would never be sated, they knew that the fiendish god would drive not only the troll race to destruction, but the entirety of the world. They rallied their forces and set sail for the eastern kingdoms, where they met up with Gurubashi trolls that were not down with the path of the Hakari. Together, they found out that a faction of Hakkar's most zealous priests, which were called the Atalai, they were trying to summon the Loa spirit into a living form. This, in turn, would awaken terrible new dimensions of his power and spell certain doom for the troll race. Horrified by the Atalai's plans, the Zandalari host stormed the Gurubashi capital of Zuguruk. Battles raged day and night. Finally, atop Hakkar's bloodstained shrine, the Zandalari defeated the Loa and most of his crazed followers. Despite this victory, the Zandalari and their allies, they agreed to remain vigilant for any sign of Hakkar's reappearance. The Loa was not truly dead. His spirits had merely been banished from the physical world, very similar to what we've seen with wild gods like Cenarius. When the orcs killed him in Warcraft 3, they didn't actually kill him. They just kicked his physical form off the planet and we later on summoned him back. A number of the Atalai priests, they had escaped the jungle and were trying again within the Swamp of Sorrows. They built the Temple of Atal Hakkar and hoped to summon the Loa once more. Dark magic twisted the flora and fauna surrounding the temple. This in turn drew the attention of the green dragon aspect Ysera, who used their might to turn the temple into the sunken temple and then left green dragons behind to guard it. They should have done a better job at clearing out the temple though, since the Atalai, they were not wiped out and the green dragons, they had to deal with the Emerald Nightmare. This gave them a chance to reboot and under the leadership of Jindo the Hexer, they discovered that the Soul Flayer could only really be summoned within the Gurubashi's ancient capital. It was in Zulgurup that Jindo enslaved several high priests of the Gurubashi to aid him in summoning the dreaded god. Newly reborn in this jungle fortress, Hakkar once again took control of the Gurubashi tribe. Even the smaller tribes like Bloodscalp, Sandfury, Skullsplitter, Vilebrand and Widabark, all of them pledged their allegiance to Jin. Reports eventually reached the Zandalari, confirming the presence of the Soul Flayer, and so they moved out to the shores of Yoyamba Isle to battle Hakkar once again. The trolls of the land banded together and sent a contingent of high priests into the ancient city. Each priest was a powerful champion of the primal gods of the Loa. We had the bat, the panther, the tiger, spider and snake. But despite the best efforts, they fell under the sway of Hakkar. The champions and their primal god aspects, they now unwillingly started feeding the awesome power of the Soul Flayer. Left with no other choice, the Zandalari recruited the champions of Azeroth, the Horde and the Alliance to aid them in their mission. For the first time, we were able to actually earn reputation with the Zandalari, which of course came with rewards like patterns, schematics, recipes, but they're also shoulder, head and leg enchants. With Exalted, you get the hero of the Zandalar tribe achievements, one that's now a feat of strength since it's no longer obtainable, and a reputation that could be earned in various ways. Clearing out Zulgurup, that was of course a good start, but there were also the Hakari Bijus to be found, which were destroyed at the altar of Sansa. Each Biju that we wrest away from the blood God's minions is one step closer to victory. The heads of the high priest responsible for channeling the Loa's energies into Hakkar, they were stringed together for exile, servitor of Rastakan. All of them, High Priestess Jacklik of the Bat Loa Herik, High Priest Vanaxus of the Snake Loa Hephus, High Priestess Marley of the Spider Loa Shadra, High Priest Tikal of the Tiger Loa Shirvala, and High Priestess Arlok of the Panther Loa Befik, all of them were taken out, weakening Hakkar's might. Then, the Soul Flayer himself became our target. Both Jindo the Hexer and Hakkar, they were taken out, clearing the threat within Zulgru once more, and we brought back the heart of Hakkar to banish to the void. With the mission done, the Zandalari left Yoyamba Isle behind, but you might remember that there was a third major tribe sent out way back when, the Drakari who moved to the north. 
that's the same area that the Lich King and the Scourge call home. Something that caused the Drakari quite a bit of trouble. While some decided to abandon a tribe and ally with the king, others decided to try and save their kingdom. Where in the past, we've seen priests embodying the powers of the Loa, some even forcing them to assist. Here the Drakari, they tap into near forgotten rituals, actually consuming their gods and stealing untold amounts of power to be used for their own purposes. While we took an active role in dealing with them, the Zandalari, they were primarily here to witness what was occurring and to chronicle the end of an empire before it was wiped out for good. That is pretty much what happened to them. Despite turning against their own gods, the Drakari Empire would fall to the might of the Undead Scourge. Yet amongst the Zandalari to witness these events was the Prophet Zul. As a member of the Zanchuli Council, he was born with the gift of sight. Even as a child, his dark and terrible visions had come true to the last horrifying detail. He commanded fear and respect as one of the Dark Prophets, seers capable of witnessing great tragedies before they came to pass. It is said the God King Rastakan, ruler of the Zandalari, lords over his mighty kingdom from a throne carved of solid gold. Years ago, as he sat upon this opulent seat of power, he was visited by the dark prophet Zul. Zul warned King Rastakan of a terrible cataclysm, for Zul had seen a vision of the great armored dragon clenching the world in his ferocious jaws. King Rastakan did nothing. Months later, Zul returned. Bearing more grim news from his visions, he saw a legion of serpents pouring forth from a gaping fissure that tore open the floor of the ocean. Still, King Rastakhan did nothing. Finally, mere months before the cataclysm, Zul returned. Tearing his clothes and throwing his staff to the ground, Zul spoke of earthquakes and tidal waves. He described the golden capital of Zandalar slowly sinking beneath the waves in the aftermath of the cataclysm. It's once great people drowning as their mighty work slipped forever beneath the sea. King Rastakhan tired of Zul and his troubling nightmares. To be rid of the prophet, he granted Zul the use of his largest ships so that he and his followers could seek a new land if his visions came to pass. And his visions did come to pass. When Deathwing rose from the Maelstrom, dark, angry waves crashed into the Zandalari capital. The spying of the land broke in two, and soon the city and all its riches began to slide into the hungry sea. The Zandalari people turned to their king for help, but there was only one Zandalari equipped to help them, the Prophet Zul. The Prophet and the mighty war fleet he had assembled while his king sat idle. You see, the true power of kings and emperors stems from the power to aid their people. The moment they fail, they cede their power to the one who can. Zul convinced the king and the council to hand over some ships and with the cataclysm he set out what the trolls have been trying to do for a very long time. He set out to regain their former glory and dominance of the land. Our kind faces extinction. Trolls once ruled the mightiest empire this world has ever seen. Yet look at you now. Zuldrak has already fallen to the Scourge. Its gods consumed as death descended on its people. Zulfarak, once the shining jewel of Tanaris, is now nothing but a wasteland. Divided, you are weak. But we, Zandalari, can offer you a future undreamed of. Jindo of the Gurubashi, would you see the greatness of Zul Garub restored? Join us, and the Zandalari will make it so. The Kara of the Amani. Summon your followers to Zul Aman. 
Together, we will make Zul'jin's murderers weep for mercy. Brothers, hear us now! We, Zandalari, have returned to reclaim the former glory of our people. To see trolls retake the lands that are rightfully ours. And to crush any foolish enough to stand in our way. From the wreckage of the Cataclysm, the Troll Empire will rise again! Vol'jin of the Dark Spear, you would turn your back on your own people? The Horde is my people. If it be war you bring, then I stand against you. So be it, Dark Spear. But against the powers we'll soon unleash, none shall stand for long. One must wonder why does Zandalari supposedly support Prophet Zul in dealing with Hakkar when during Classic they found out just how dangerous this Loa is? All the same, Vol'jin of the Dark Spear tribe, he does not agree with Zul's plans. Actually, quite the opposite. As history repeated itself, he stood against the Zandalari. He stood against them as Jindo tried to enslave Hakkar. He stood against them as the new leader of the Amani tried to bring war. He stood against them when the Zandalari returned to Pandaria, the mist disappearing with Mr. Pandaria, where they achieved the resurrection of Leish and the Thunder King. Yet all the same, they failed in their conquests of trying to take Pandaria as the new land. Despite his visions, the Zandalari Empire has been unable to reclaim what is lost so many years ago. As Garrosh once said, times change and those that cling to the dreams of the past they're ultimately doomed to fall to the reality of the present. Time and time again, we see that Azeroth is now home to new races, new powers, and to stand a chance against the future, the Zandalari will have to change. That is, where Battle of Azeroth comes in, an allegiance with the Horde and Zandalari joining their ranks. It's not 100% set in stone, but so far their classes appear to be Druid, Hunter, Mage, Priest, Rogue, Shaman, Warlock and Warrior. Their totems, they look pretty awesome, and their druid forms are simply out of this world. But since all of that is Battle for Azeroth stuff, time will tell how all of that's going to play out. For now though, I hope I've been able to give you a clear understanding of where the Zandalari started, what the society is like, and what the role within the World of Warcraft has been. If you are interested in spoilers, then by all means check out the story of Zuldasar from the Alpha. And of course, if you're looking for more details and all the things that we talked about today, then check out the related WoW article in the description down below. Thank you very much for watching everyone, subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time guys, see ya!